It's a great day to be in God's Word, so welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Sweats, and I'm so glad that you've hopped aboard the Bible bus with us as we head off to the Old Testament and the first study in the book of Jeremiah. So as you find your seat on the Bible bus and open to chapter 1, here are a few introductory remarks from Dr. McGee. My beloved, our study today brings us to one of the most important books of the Bible. Now, I know that I say this many times. In fact, in our five-year program, I say it 66 times because I think every book of the Bible is an important book, and when we're studying it, it becomes the most important book. Well, this is the prophecy of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is one of the most unusual prophets that we have. We know a great deal about him. Some of the other prophets, we are not so well acquainted. We do not know too much about Obadiah. In fact, we know practically nothing. But we know a great deal about this man. He tells us a great deal about himself. In fact, we have come very close to him. And when the Lord Jesus came into this world, actually there were some people that thought he was Jeremiah. And we'll see why that is true. And so we are going to come to this book. But first of all, let me say that someone has sent in to me this little bit of doggerel. It says, when a man's Bible comes apart, it's a sure thing that he's put together all right. And that reminded me that I saw two Bibles in a church do not know who they belonged to. They apparently had been left after the service, and folk had forgotten them. And one Bible, it was all apart, and notes in it, and that was from Genesis to Revelation. I'm sure that they listened to the through the Bible radio. And then I picked up another Bible, and I noticed that the New Testament was pretty well worn, but very frankly, when I got into the minor prophets, there were pages stuck together that I'm confident that those books had never even been read at all. And I think that Jeremiah hadn't been read too much. Well, I hope your Bible reveals that you've read a great deal about Jeremiah. He's worth reading about. Yep, we got so much to discover about Jeremiah over the next few weeks, so join us for each study. And if you haven't already downloaded the notes and outlines that Dr. McGee mentioned, you can get them right now. They're packed with helpful information and an overview of this study on Jeremiah. Dr. McGee created these notes to be given for free to anyone who wants them. The best way to get the notes on Jeremiah and all the notes and outlines in our five-year study is in our app, if you listen there. Or equally great is our digital book titled Briefing the Bible. Download your copy right now or order your abridged paperback version at ttb.org. Or if we can help you, call 1-800-65-BIBLE. It's time to begin our study, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, would you prepare our hearts for what you want us to receive from your Word and in the coming weeks through your study in Jeremiah? Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to hear and respond to your truth as it relates to our lives and your work in this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're off to Jeremiah chapter 1 on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come to one of the most remarkable books in the Bible, and I'm sure that you've heard me say that. Many times. In fact, when we have finished the five-year course, you will have heard me say that 66 times because every book in the Bible is remarkable. But this book is remarkable in a very unusual way. Most of the prophets hide themselves and maintain a character of anonymity. That is they do not project themselves on the page of their prophecy. But we come now to a prophet whose prophecy is largely autobiographical, and certainly in many places that is true. And I have put in our notes just some of the things, and I'd like to run through them briefly for you to let you know 
that this man, what we're going to look at, and we'll take each one of these up separately. And first of all, he was born a priest in Anathoth, just north of Jerusalem. And second, he was chosen to be a prophet before he was born. Third, he was called to the prophetic office while very young. He was commissioned of God to be a prophet. He began his ministry during the reign of King Josiah, and he was a mourner at his funeral. And then the sixth thing, he was forbidden to marry because of the terrible times in which he lived. And the seventh thing, he never made a convert. He was rejected by his people. He was hated. He was beaten. He was put in stocks. He was imprisoned. He was charged with being a traitor. The eighth, his message broke his own heart. Nine, he wanted to resign, but God wouldn't let him. And the tenth, he saw the destruction of Jerusalem and the Babylonian captivity. He was permitted to remain in the land by the captain of the Babylonian forces. When the remnant wanted to flee to Egypt, Jeremiah prophesied against it. He was forced to go with the remnant to Egypt, and he died there. Tradition says that he was stoned by the remnant. Here's a remarkable man, this man Jeremiah. I call him God's crybaby. For that's what he was, a man in tears most of the time. And God chose this man. He had a woman's heart, a mother's heart. He had a trembling voice and tear-filled eyes. But he was called to deliver a harsh message of judgment. The message that he gave broke his own heart. This man, a great man of God, may I say to you, I don't think that you and I would pick this kind of a man to give a message. At least I don't think that we would. We would want to pick some hard-boiled person to give a hard-boiled message, would we not? But God didn't pick this kind of a man at all. He picked a man like this, and the message broke his heart. I want to read two statements made concerning Jeremiah by great men of the past. And I'd not want to begin this study without passing this on to you. Lord Macaulay said this concerning this man. It is difficult to conceive any situation more painful than that of a great man condemned to watch the lingering agony of an exhausted country to tend it during the alternate fits of stupefaction and raving which people in dissolution and to see the symptoms of vitality disappear one by one till nothing is left but coldness, darkness, and corruption. That was the position and the call of Jeremiah. He stood by and saw his people go into captivity. Now, the other statement I'd like to read concerning him, Dr. Moorhead has given us this very graphic picture of him. And will you listen to this? It's tremendous. I'm reading now. It was Jeremiah's lot to prophesy at a time when all things in Judah were rushing down to the final and mournful catastrophe when political excitement was at its height, when the worst passions swayed the various parties and the most fatal counsels prevailed, it was his to stand in the way over which his nation was rushing headlong to destruction, to make a heroic effort to arrest it and to turn it back and to fail and be compelled to step to one side and see his own people, whom he loved with the tenderness of a woman, plunge over the precipice into the wide, weltering ruin. These are tremendous statements made concerning that. You and I are probably living at a time just like that. We're a great nation today. 
and we've accomplished many things. We've gone to the moon. We have atom bombs. We're a strong nation. But inside our nation today, there is this same corruption that is carrying us down, actually will carry us down to a dismemberment and to disaster. It's coming, my friend. Revolution may be around the corner. Now, I know that what I'm saying is not popular today. You just don't say it. You have now nice panels where you discuss how we're going to improve society and how we can work out our problems. And today, God is totally left out of the picture, absolutely left out. And today, if the Bible is mentioned, it's mentioned in a way with a curled lip by some unbeliever. The ones who are believers who have a message from God are pushed aside. I know that. And may I say to you, I'm not sure, but what we are very much in the same position that Jeremiah was in. And for that reason, I'd like to say that I feel that this book is going to have a message for us today. And I hope that you'll ask your friends to listen in. I hope you'll ask them to write in and get notes and outlines. And I hope you have them because they're important for this book. Now, God chose this man who had a mother's heart, a trembling voice, and tear-filled eyes to deliver a harsh message of judgment. And the message that he gave broke his own heart. Now, one author has put it like this. He was not a man mighty as Elijah, eloquent as Isaiah, are seraphic as Ezekiel, but one who was timid and shrinking, conscious of his helplessness, yearning for a sympathy and love he was never to know. Such was the chosen organ through which the word of the Lord came to that corrupt and degenerate age. Now, when the Lord Jesus appeared, he asked the question of his own, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? There was a difference of opinion. None of them really knew, and those who did not know him had some different ideas. Some thought he was Elijah, and there was a reason for that. Some thought he was John the Baptist, reason for that. And some thought he was Jeremiah. And may I say to you, those who thought that had a good reason for believing it because Jeremiah was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And the difference between him and the Lord Jesus was that the Lord Jesus was bearing your sorrows and my grief and my sorrows and your grief while Jeremiah was carrying his own burden and it broke his heart. He went to the Lord one time and he says, I can't keep on. This thing's tearing me to pieces. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. You better get somebody else. Oh, the Lord says, all right, but I'll just hold your resignation here on my desk because I think you'll be back. And he came back and he said, you know, the word of God was like fire in my bones. I had to give it, although it broke his heart. And God wanted that kind of man. And you know why? Because... That's the only kind of man that can give a harsh message. Now, we'd want some hard-boiled fella. My feeling is that you need somebody to be able to talk up to some of these world dictators today. But you know, God, I don't think he'd pick that kind of man. He'd send somebody with a broken heart. And why did he? God wanted the children of Israel to know, though he was sending them into captivity, that he was judging them, that it was breaking his heart. And as Isaiah said, judgment is his strange work. This is the man that we're going to look at. Jeremiah, the prophet. He is here identified for us. And probably ought to mention this. He began his ministry about a century after Isaiah, a hundred years after Isaiah. And he came along at the time of the Babylonian captivity 
And he began during the reign of Josiah, and he continued right on down through the Babylonian captivity. And he's the one that predicted the 70 years captivity in Babylon. And he saw beyond all that darkness to the light. And no prophet spoke so glowingly of the future as he did. And we'll have occasion to see that. Now, the message of Jeremiah was not only unwelcome, but it was actually rejected. And the thing that I think characterizes this man's message is backsliding. It occurs 13 times. It's used only four other times in the Old Testament, in the book of Proverbs once and in Hosea three times. And Hosea's message is that of the backsliding nation. And we have here another word that occurs. Babylon occurs 164 times more than in the rest of Scripture combined. Babylon became the enemy. Now let me read, beginning here with verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests that were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Now I'm not going to turn to this. This reveals, however, something I said when we were in the historical books. I said, beginning with 1 Samuel, going through 2 Chronicles, that those three series of double books were historical books that should be woven in, or the prophets, rather, should be woven in to that period because that's the period in which the prophets spoke except the post-captivity prophets of Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the last three in the Old Testament. Now what we have here in this first verse is a reference to Hilkiah, who was his father. Now Hilkiah was the high priest who found the book of the law of the Lord that was given by Moses during the time of Josiah, and that is the thing that sparked the revival during the reign of Josiah. Now, you'll find that back in 2 Kings, the 22nd chapter, and in 2 Chronicles, the 34th chapter, and I'm not going to turn to it. Now, he says he was in Anathoth. That was his hometown. It was just a few miles directly north of Jerusalem. Now, you'll notice here, he says, to whom... The word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of his reign. Now, Josiah was eight years old when he came to the throne. He reigned 31 years. Jeremiah began his ministry when Josiah was 22 years old, and he prophesied during 18 years of Josiah's reign. And Jeremiah was a mourner at the funeral. And that is in 2 Chronicles 35, 25 of Josiah. Josiah did a very foolish thing. And sometimes God's men do very foolish things. He went over to fight against the Pharaoh of Egypt at Carchemish when he came up actually not against Judah at all, but for some strange reason, why Josiah went after him, and out there in the Valley of Esdraelon, Armageddon, if you please, at Megiddo, why Josiah was slain. And this man Jeremiah mourned because this was a good reign, and it was actually the last revival that came to these people, and it was a great revival. And Jeremiah mourned because he saw that the nation was going to lapse now into a night out of which it would not come until after the Babylonian captivity. We find here in verse 3 now, chapter 1 of Jeremiah, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unto the carrying away of Jerusalem captive, in the fifth month. So now we are told here very definitely that Jeremiah began his ministry during the reign of Josiah, the 13th year. 
And he conducted his ministry right on down through the Babylonian captivity. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar had received a message from Jeremiah, and he told his captain, you let that man, Jeremiah, do what he wants to do. If he wants to come with the other captives, fine. If he wants to stay there, let him stay there. And what, of course, actually happened was Jeremiah did not want to go with the captain. They had rejected his message. They're going into Babylonian captivity, and Nebuchadnezzar is permitting him to make his choice. So he remained with those few that remained. And then those fugitives took off and went down to Egypt, and they did it against the advice of Jeremiah and his wisdom. And finally, they apparently stoned him to death. That's the story of this man. You see, we know a great deal about Jeremiah. We don't know that much about Isaiah or Ezekiel. We probably know a great deal about Daniel because the first part of his prophecy is rather personal also. But now take the minor prophets, and some of them, we know nothing about him. That man Obadiah, we just don't know a thing about him. And there are others just like that. Now we find here in verse 3 that Jehoahaz, a son of Josiah, who's not mentioned here, he reigned only three months. He didn't even get the throne warm until they eliminated him. And then the king of Egypt placed his brother Eliakim, Jehoiakim, upon the throne. He reigned 11 years. And it was Jeremiah warning him not to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And he did. And the king took him captive to Babylon and placed on the throne at that time in Jerusalem, Jehoiachin, and he reigned three months and ten days. And he's not mentioned here because of the fact that he didn't get the throne warm either until he's eliminated. And Nebuchadnezzar took him captive to Babylon and placed Zedekiah, his father's brother, on the throne, and he reigned eleven years. And he's mentioned here, then Zedekiah rebelled, and Nebuchadnezzar came and destroyed Jerusalem, slew his son, put out his eyes, and took him captive to Babylon. Now that, you say, is very brutal. I agree with you, it's very brutal. But you must remember, Nebuchadnezzar had been very patient with that city, and the city and the people refused to listen to Jeremiah. We'll see that as we go into the prophecy. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, we only got our foot in the door of our study in Jeremiah, but already it's thrilling, isn't it? The truths that we're going to hear about aren't always going to be easy, and it's no wonder that Jeremiah was called the prophet of the broken heart. And that said, I promise that you're going to want to be aboard the Bible bus for every message in this series. But in case you do miss one, or if you'd like the entire series to listen to again at your own pace, get our app. You can download it from either of the app stores or visit ttb.org. You can find all the resources that we offer to enhance your personal study of the Bible. Again, the number to call is 1-800-65-BIBLE or visit ttb.org. Now, be sure to check out the many free digital booklets that we offer by Dr. McGee as well. One that might be helpful in your own study or as you reach out and share God's Word with others is How to Understand the Bible. It's taken from his audio study, Guidelines for Understanding Scripture. Dr. McGee gives seven basic steps to help you get the most out of your time in God's Word. So you can download How to Understand the Bible over at ttb.org or call 1-800-65-BIBLE if we can help you find it. And if God has given you a compassionate heart for others and a vision to share God's whole word with the whole world, why don't you join our world prayer team? Because that's our vision too. Now, if you sign up for the World Prayer Team as part of the committed group of prayer warriors, you're going to join me and thousands of other Through the Bible listeners as we travel the world, figuratively speaking, on our knees, praying for one country at a time. You can sign up. It's super easy. Just go over to ttb.org forward slash pray. And together, we're going to pray for listeners like these in Argentina who write, We are a young couple with two children who are following the Lord. Listening to your study is changing our lives and helping us to be godly parents. Please pray that our children will come to love God's Word. And then here's a recent note from Eliezer in Brazil. I discovered you on the radio when I was five years old, and today I'm 47 years old. 
I now put the radio on for my children to listen to. I remember we used to wake up early to go to manual work on the farm, and we would listen to the Bible first, drinking coffee, until the broadcast went off the air. Please pray for my family that they too will become lifelong listeners and students of God's Word. Well, let's pray for both of these families as we go about our day. And join me next time as our five-year journey through the Bible continues. grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners, whom God uses to take the whole word to the whole world.